everybody, and welcome to Cruising History and Stories with Dr. Craig Hendricks and Lucy Jagger. Grizzly 
Ugly deaths of lions, and many other things we'll hear about tonight. She makes any project better because she's relentless in finding information that's verifiable and accurate. Together we wrote a script with many characters which Lucy will bring to life. The silly parts are mine, and the history is days. <laughs> we also want to thank uh, Kim Killingsworth, who's there in the back. Uh, he, early on, he met with us and talked about his love of cars, about his youth spent cruising the streets of Long Beach in a, in a hot car, and things he witnessed with the car clubs he knew. He also sent us a packet of first person accounts that became the story that Lucy will tell us, Kim. And, and we must confess, it's the only section written by someone who actually ever did it. <laughs> like Kay, Dr. Craig Hendricks is a historian. He also read books and did research, and he called an old friend to get some real life stories. Craig is the kind of historian who makes everything interesting. I doubt there was ever a glazed eye in his classes, and you're going to see why tonight. <laughs> he talks about history like it's a story that just happens to be factual. Um, he's got a researcher's discipline and a writer's ear for material. And Lucy Daggett is an actress with a capital A. It was her idea to make some of tonight's characters male. I thought that was crazy. But, when, um, but she was right, and you'll shortly see that. She's done every kind of acting imaginable, um, but her favorite are musicals, and you're going to see why that, too, in a minute. So we're really lucky to have her. She makes the stories come alive, and you're going to love her. We all do. For me, the best part about this was the rehearsal. We had too much fun to call it work. We thank Craig for letting us invade his house on Saturday mornings when normal people are drinking coffee and reading the paper. And with that, let's hop in a truck time traveling Chevy for a ride with Craig and Lucy.
As the ruined world economies rebuilt themselves with aid from the United States, American companies mass-produced billions of dollars worth of consumer goods and dominated the world markets for the next few decades anyway. Automobiles, rubber tires, steel, copper, many other items once tightly rationed during the war now became easily available to General, as General Motors, Ford, American Motors, remember American Motors, and dozens of other automobile companies produced, cre introduced credit plans enabling a rapidly growing middle class to acquire new cars. Older, less desirable models sat in used car, used car lots and junkyards of America until a new generation of backyard mechanics and tinkerers saw the possibilities. Combined with a vast amount of war surplus material of every description that piled up in discount stores and in storage yards throughout the 1950s, older cars and used Jeeps became a treasure trove for creative Americans. Can you believe it's 1949 already? Oh, I sure can't. My name is Lolly. My husband is Bill. We have a daughter, Lucy. She's 10. You know, it seems just like yesterday that the war finally ended. When Pearl Harbor was attacked, we were scared to death that Long Beach would be next. As the war went on, we planted victory gardens and helped with collection drives to get old bikes, cooking grease, and all kinds of things that the government needed. One thing we didn't do much of was shopping because everything was rationed. Other than war bonds, there just really wasn't much to buy. We had a car, a 1935 Ford, but gas was rationed, so we really didn't drive it much. In 1943, Bill enlisted in the Navy. They trained him to work on their vehicles. Turned out he had quite a knack for it and was one of the best in his outfit. When the war ended in 1945, he mustered out. With his experience in the Navy, he got a job in the service department at Mackenzie Ford on American Avenue here in Long Beach. Now, new cars hadn't been produced since 1942, so there was plenty of business keeping people's cars serviced. Bill was always busy, and he's so good with customers that he was promoted to service manager last year. It's a steady job, and it pays well. Houses, schools, and churches have been going up all over Long Beach. The population here grew during the war, and it seems that most people stayed. And with the men safe at home, <laughs> we've sure seen plenty of new babies coming along. <laughs> but Bill and I saved our money during the war, and with his job at Ford, we bought a new house on Rose Avenue in North Long Beach last year. There was a school being built right around the corner, Bret Hart Elementary. It was finished in January. Lucy and her classmates were the first ones to play on the playground, sit in the new classrooms, and use the new desks. I hate to sound um, frivolous, but there was so much we couldn't have during the war that now, <laughs> We're practically giddy with everything we could buy. A few years ago, we got a television. The game shows we listen to on the radio, we now see on television. What a difference. Oh, I love seeing the prizes. The modern appliances, wristwatches, and perfumes. I want them all. <laughs> We got new appliances for the house. A washing machine, a refrigerator, even a toaster that pops the bread up. <laughs> and last month, we got a new car for the whole family. Well, of course, it's a Ford. Car companies knew the war would end soon and were working on new designs, and they stoked the desire for new cars with advertising. Ford ran ads that said, there's a Ford in your future. So when the new models hit the showrooms, the customers would be there waiting. Our new Ford is a baby blue sedan. Oh, it looks so modern compared to our old car. We bought it from McKinsey, of course. 
We thought about trading in our 35, but Bill thought we could get a better price selling it ourselves. His friend who works at an auto parts store told us that teenagers are buying up the cars that people like us are selling. They're buying them, and some are turning them into hot rods. <laughs> hot rods. I, I wasn't sure that I wanted our car to be turned into a street racer. I don't think that's safe. But Bill reassured me that our car went to a nice young man who wants to fix it all up, but not for racing. Hmm. I sure hope he wasn't saying that just to get the car. <laughs> Endless Highways to Prosperity, 1955. The National Highway Act created a system of multi-lane paved roadways spanning the nation in the mid-1950s. In California, the State Transportation Department spent a million dollars a month building freeways to connect all areas of the Golden State. Some highway construction divided and destroyed communities while knitting the state together with asphalt and concrete. The car became king while rail and trolley lines systematically withered. By 1960, all communities with at least 5,000 citizens found themselves connected to the state and interstate highway systems. The state's population stimulated by the war topped 15 million in 1960 and 20 million by 1970. One source of this rapid population growth can be found in the 73 million children born in the United States between World War II and about 1968. This baby boomer generation became a moving wave in American society, creating demand for hospitals, schools, new homes, colleges, and jobs as they grew up to be demanding consumers. Prosperity meant disposable income for many families in Southern California. Miles of fresh roadway beckoned an army of young men and women freed from the worries wrought by a decade of depression and a world war turned their tinkering skills and free time to cars, which were soon, soon being produced across the land at the rate of 10 million a year by the main, major manufacturers. Tom McEwen and his buddies in Bixby Knowles began modifying family cars in the early 1950s, racing them along local streets for bragging rights. Roaring up and down San Antonio Drive and Cherry Avenue, usually at night to dodge the police. The street racers had few options since there were few local racing strips. Longtime Orange County racer C.J. Hart convinced authorities to allow him to turn an, un an unused airport runway into a drag strip. Supported by local officials, the California Highway Patrol, and some local media, the strip in Santa Ana attracted racers from the area and became a success. Aware of that success, Long Beach leaders pledged to find a venue for the rapidly developing racing scene in town. Dozens of local clubs held events, met up at local drive-in restaurants in town, and read the newly established Drag News, which began publishing in March 1955. <coughs> the children, <coughs> concerned by the growing number of street racers appearing in his court with various violations, Judge Fred Miller began the process that led to the building of a local drag strip, Lions Associated Drag Strip. Miller brought together car enthusiasts and racers Eddie Baker and Mickey Thompson with 11 local Lions clubs from San Pedro, Wilmington, uh, Lakewood, Harbor City, Belmont Shore, West Long Beach, among others, to work out an agreement on opening a drag strip. The group eventually found 43 acres of land owned by the Los Angeles Harbor Department and negotiated a lease. The Lions Club hoped to promote safe racing, and city and county and state police agencies added their support. Hi, I'm Lucy. As a lolly daughter, Lucy, she still thinks of me as a child. But it's 1955, and I'm 15. I'm a sophomore at Jordan High. In a couple of months, I'll turn 16 and get my driver's license. <laughs> I can't wait. <sighs> I love cars. When I was nine, we went to the Ford plant in the harbor to see our new car rolling off the assembly line. And from that moment on, I loved cars. I guess I take after my dad in that respect. I also like boys with cars. <laughs> my mom and I went to see the movie Rebel 
without a cause? And now she's convinced teenage boys are dangerous. I keep telling her it's just a movie, but it's pointless. Well, sure, some of the boys who got the old cars stripped down the bodies and modified the engines to make them go really fast. Some even paint flames on the sides or pinstripe them to make them look really cool. <laughs> My mom can't understand why they work so hard to change the ways that the cars look. She thinks it's silly, but they want cars to look different, to be cool and look hip. Duh. They show them off with the drive-ins around town, like Clock and Rissinger's. We sit in our cars, and waitresses on roller skates come up and take the food orders. We turn on the radio and sing along to our favorite songs. My favorite is uh, Maybelline by Chuck Berry. I love the part about the V8 Ford. Uh, I can't like a rolling on the open road. Nothing will outrun my V8 Ford. The Cadillac do about 95. She's bumping up on the road side by side. Maybelline, why can't you be true? Oh, Maybelline, why can't you be true? You started out doing the things you used to do. Yeah. <laughs> Place they can, like on the streets, between stoplights. When the light turns green, they peel out and race to the first red light they come to, and whoever gets there first wins. I know it scares my mother to death, but to me, it's kind of exciting. <laughs> of course, my mom, who worries about everything, thinks I'm going to die in a car accident like James Dean did, but my dad, is on my side about cars. <coughs> he kind of has to be working for McKinsey Ford and all. He's also a member of the North Long Beach Lions. He likes going there to talk about the latest models in McKinsey showroom. Every year, the Lions put on a carnival in Houghton Park. He's always one of the people who helps set up the booths and make sure that everyone is having a good time. But Long Beach is worried about the drag racers. Judge said somebody needed to create a place the hot rodders can race so they don't terrorize people like my mother. <laughs> so the local Lions Clubs raised the money and they hired Mickey Thompson, that famous race car designer, to set up a track. It's called Lions Drag Strip and it opened last week. According to my dad, Mickey did everything. He plowed the field, even dug the holes for the fence. Oh, I looked forward to October 9th for a long time. That was opening day. Nearly 20,000 people showed up. That was way more than they expected. The parking lot filled up in no time. There were so many people that ticket sellers couldn't keep up. People tore out part of the fences to get in. The PA system didn't work very well. The toilets overflowed, and the snack bar ran out of food. But everybody said day was a success. The 1960s, drag racing. The 1960s opened with a feeling that the future was golden. Young, a young and energetic president, John F. Kennedy, took command and challenged Americans to think and act boldly, accept challenges, and make the world a better place. He pledged to confront the spread of Soviet influence around the globe, dispatching American soldiers to far out countries that would soon become familiar, Laos, Vietnam, and Cambodia. Uh, Americans became increasingly aware of, of space exploration as President Kennedy poured millions into the Mercury and Apollo space programs. Colonel John Glenn orbited the Earth in 1961 in a stunning display of American technological prowess. It seemed we could accomplish anything as a nation we chose to do. A movement that had begun to improve living conditions and empower citizens in the southern states now blossomed into a national movement led by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and spread across the nation as citizens of color demanded equal rights long denied. 
Tens of thousands answered his call and worked in discrimination with demonstrations, voting registration, and community organizing. American cities experienced violence and disruption when demands for justice met with resistance. The experience of participating in mass movements to end what many considered a significant moral issue empowered people to take the lessons of mass protest into other areas of national life. Children, the children born in the 1940s were now full-fledged consumers. Their tastes in clothing, music, entertainment, food, and recreation drove American businesses to innovate, develop new products, and expand the reach of corporations into new areas. Television, once restricted by cost and technology to a small number of American families, now became available to virtually all citizens. Advertising reached into all corners of American life, promising unrivaled abundance to all. Accounting for about 7% of the world's population in 1962, the U.S. consumed 55% of its electricity, and 60% of the automobiles produced globally were produced here. And our standard of living exceeded all other nations by a comparable size and population by a significant margin. Our cities expanded into nearby suburbs, housing sprouted where orchards and fields once produced crops, and superhighways linked all parts of the nation. One result of these changes to American society was the creation of leisure time. Time to tinker, to build, and to experiment. Hey, I'm Bob. Yeah, Bob from Boston. I came out with my parents, went to Jordan. I'm a vet, served in Vietnam. Been back about a year. Until a few months ago, I had a 32 Ford took a alliance to test it against the other hot rods. Mickey Thompson, the guy who ran the place, welcomed all comers, amateurs, as well as professionals. Anyone who thought he had a hot car could drive up to the line and see how fast he could do a quarter mile. Hmm. I did okay. Then my son came along and my wife said it was too dangerous and made me quit. Figured it was best not to point out so that in a war zone was dangerous too. <laughs> anyway, I still love racing, and so now I volunteer at Lions. My form was cool and everything, but serious races are really something else. They can take them down and put them back together with parts from other cars. They test ideas at Lions. Now, not all of them pan out. But some set new speed records, or even find their way into cars made in Detroit. Now, when it comes to keeping track of records, drivers don't mess around. When a guy sets a record for time, he wants it to mean something to the other drivers. That takes precision. None of this flag <coughs> stuff and stopwatch stuff. Lions knew meticulous timekeeping mattered to the guys. So they installed precisely, they installed precisely timed lights that told the drivers when to pull up, when to take off, and signal when one of them crossed the finish line. It was all automated. No room for human error. That way, they knew the times were reliable and could be trusted. Lions was all about speed. It got so those dragsters went so fast, even disc brakes couldn't stop them before they'd shoot right off the end of the track. So they added parachutes to the back to slow them down and stop them. Another thing that happened was bigger prizes let mechanics experiment with custom pots instead of what they got in scrap yards. Cars were modified to get off the line faster. Some loaded trunks with lead and added wide rear tires without treads. Others chopped and channeled their cars and lengthened the distance from the rear wheel to the front. Now most cars are less than 15 feet long, but top fuel dragsters kept getting longer. They didn't care about the portion or what the car looked like. They just wanted it to go as fast as possible over a quarter mile. Pretty soon, dragsters didn't look like regular cars at all. 
Why should they only run on gasoline when jet planes and missiles use more powerful fuels? Well, after some unfortunate experiences, some were banned and they added rules to help cut down on the danger. Now they use nitromethane and are on the way to reaching speeds of more than 300 miles per hour. They produce more horsepower than all of the cars in the first four rows of stars in the NASCAR Daytona 500. Then, there are the funny cars. That was originally meant as an insult. The top fuel guys don't see the point of fiberglass bodies that look like a regular car. They say, sure, the customized engines make them faster than regular cars, but why even bother? They'll never go as fast as top fuel. Me? Well, I love them all. Whether it was my 32 Ford, top fuel dragster, or a funny car. I sure hope my sons grow up to love cars the way I do. Racing through the 1960s, change. American society began to experience both the success and the problems of its new role as a world leader deeply involved in international affairs. On one hand, material progress enhanced and strengthened by wartime spending in the 1940s and 1950s led to a booming consumer economy, new housing within the reach of, mo of most of the rapidly expanding middle class, and a seemingly endless supply of consumer goods. Uh, however, by 1965, it became increasingly clear that the flood of prosperity did not live all, lift all boats equally. Large areas of the country were stubbornly immune to the new prosperity as technological advances and new jobs swept past. Author Michael Harrington pointed out that nearly one-fourth of Americans still live below the poverty line, a newly established measure that defined both rural and urban living conditions. Migrant workers harvested the easily available crops that graced the dinner tables of many Americans, although low wages and deplorable working conditions prompted a CBS television network to produce the documentary called Harvest of Shame. Sharecropping and tenant farmers and tenant farming persisted in the agricultural areas of the country, ensuring that poverty would persist through a new generation of workers. Responding to this puzzle of want and lack of opportunity interlaced with a mushroomingly, the mushrooming of beautiful new suburbs and endless supply of supply of shiny new homes and cars, the post-war generation of young Americans began to ask critical questions and take action. Everyone could see the cornucopia of products every night on their televisions. From just a few thousand television sets in 1949, over a hundred million sets now resided in American homes, bringing information, news, product advertisements to the entire country in a way that was not possible just a generation earlier. Young men and young women joined organizations to fight poverty, improve living conditions, ensure equal rights for all Americans, marches, protests, drives to register new voters, and many other forms of activism began to discomfort, challenge, and generally annoy the established order in the country. Martin Luther King Jr., Cesar Chavez, Malcolm X, and many others pushed the country to live up to its founding ideals that all men are created equal. Energized by such movements, American women formed national organizations and worked for change as well. Long oppressed groups, largely invisible in American society, now joined the movement for serious social change. Inevitably, when the gay and transgender community pursued equal rights, resistance to such challenges followed. Yet, in retrospect, the challenges by Americans to the way things were can be seen as the natural product of a country that accepted and overcame one obstacle after another. Change was both beneficial and largely painful to many in society. One unexpected and horrific result of these attempts at change was the backlash of violence, death, and discouragement when those seeking change were attacked and murdered. The deaths of civil rights workers in the South created great fear. In the assassinations of national political leaders such as President Kennedy and his brother, Senator Robert Kennedy, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., black nationalist leader Malcolm X, and the attempted killing of Governor George Wallace as he campaigned in 1968 sent a, sent a chill of confusion and fear across the country. Mm. 
Lyons Drag Strip was conceived by a male judge. It was brought into being by a man's service <coughs> and a man named Nicky Thompson. The drivers were male, and when one looked in the stands, it was mostly male faces looking back. Now, I have nothing against men. In fact, some women might say, I have the dream job. I work at Lyons. I'm one of the few females surrounded by a sea of men. I'm not a mechanic. I don't drive a car. But I'm an important part of the drag strip. My name is Holly. We moved here because my father could make more money in the California oil fields than the ones in Texas. On weekends, Daddy rebuilt a 1935 Chevy and started racing in the dry lake beds out there in the Mojave Desert. He got to know people at the Southern California Timing Association and ended up working for them. You might could say that that's how I got started. And now, I'm the official record keeper for Lions. I've been here pretty much from the beginning. When I told them that my dad worked with the SCTA and I knew how to keep records, they hired me on the spot. Now, I'm not the only woman at Lions, of course. There were women working at the snack bar, making and serving the food, keeping bathrooms and public spaces clean, you know the ones who keep things tidy enough to ward off germs and epidemics in the health department? Well, of course women can do a lot more at a racetrack than just cook and clean. I grew up hearing comedians telling jokes about women drivers. Their jokes were always one-liners. They had to be short so men could understand them. <laughs> It turns out women are actually better drivers than men. Insurance company statistics say it's the men who are involved in more accidents. They cause more crashes and even die more often in cars. That's why insurance companies generally assign lower insurance rates to women. Now, not many of these good women drivers went into racing, but last year, 1965, Shirley Will Downey became the first woman to win a license from the NHRA. Oh, I'm a big fan of hers. People underestimate women sometimes. Men told Shirley that driving race cars, no place for gals. She said they changed their mind and she proved she could fill the stands when she raced. Speaking of crowds and stands, last year the American Hot Rod Association held its national championship at Lions. More than 8,000 people attended the championships each day. We watched the fastest cars from all over the country compete for $136,000 in cash. They were so fast, you couldn't see anything but flaming exhausts and blowing parachutes. Oh, my, my. What a sight. But racetracks are dangerous places. Harold Amex died when his engine blew and his car drove through a fence at 170 miles an hour. Joseph Jackson died during a trial run when his car flipped over and hit a fence and then a pole. John Hoffman was killed when his homemade dragster went out of control and rolled over six times. But Accidents don't seem to bother the man. They just keep making the dragsters faster and more powerful, whether it's dangerous or not. But they definitely made me a lot more conscientious about buckling my seatbelt. <laughs> Better reflexes and better concentration, the little ladies. Automobile racing in general, and drag racing especially, remained largely a male preoccupation in the years after World War II. Women, of course, were present in the early days, but mostly as decoration. Linda Vaughn, Miss Golden Shifter of 1966, <laughs> said women mostly smiled, waved, and hugged and kissed the winning driver. 
Doris Herbert, however, did have some impact as the editor of Drag News, but women generally remained in the background. As with all things in American life, however, times changed. In 1966, Shirley Shahan of Tulare began racing super stocks at tracks in Central California. Successful there, she moved on to dragsters, acquiring sponsorships and appearing in the Pomona Winter National Races. The National Hot Rod Association required all drivers, including women, to take written and driving tests. And once they passed, they were reluctantly allowed to participate. There was a backlash from male drivers and some sponsors, and the NHRA rescinded the licenses of several women drivers to compete in about one-third of the organization's competition classes. Mm -hmm. Women Drivers Association felt lacked the stamina and strength required to properly handle the powerful cars in drag racing. Then, Shirley Muldowney showed up. She began appearing and winning races at all, at all levels. When asked about her success, Shirley said, women, I think, have better reflexes and better concentration for racing. Frank Hawley, who trained drivers for competition at all levels, agreed with Shirley, noting, driving a drag show is never a matter of stamina and strength, but rather a test of concentration, judgment, and awareness. It also helped, he felt, that women drivers have a kick-ass attitude. <laughs> Apparently, Shirley and a number of women drivers met that qualification easily. She and Don Garlitz engaged in a number of mass match races for $2,500 in a battle of the sexes competition, eagerly sponsored by tracks across the country, entertaining enthusiastic crowds, cheering on both drivers. Both won their share of these battles. Shirley eventually won three NHRA titles in the 1970s and 1980s, a feat matched by only one other driver. Still, race promoters struggle with how to effectively use women. At Capital Raceway in Maryland, promoters staged a miniskirt contest in 1970. And Tom McEwen drove the Hearst Golden Shifter Girls up and down the race track before powder puff races and underpowered stock cars. Match races between two women drivers became a regular feature at most tracks in the eastern U.S. In 1971, a track in Pennsylvania featured a Women's Liberation Night, matching Paula Murphy and Bella Woods, two well-known women drivers, against the best men drivers. The women lost that night, but the contest drew cheering crowds and a happy race promoter. The Drag News reported that male drivers were beginning to take such match races seriously because they didn't want the embarrassment of losing to slightly built and very attractive women drivers such as Shirley Muldowney and Shirley Shannon. Not that it was all fun and games. Racing was and is a dangerous business. More than a dozen drivers died in top field dragsters in the 1960s, some of them in Lions. Shirley herself survived a devastating crash in 1984, only to make a successful return to racing. And the ability to make a significant living in racing always remained elusive, as George Hoover, who was a noted reporter, uh, said in 1981, very few drivers have really made much money racing for a living. Hi, I'm Kim. Yeah, a guy named Kim. I go to Poly, class of 67. I'll graduate in June. I got a driver's license, a car, and plenty of pretty girls to ride around with me. I just wish the Vietnam War was over so I could stop worrying about it. But mostly, I think about my car. You might say, cars are in my blood. My father's family came to Long Beach about 1939. Dad went to Jordan. In 1949, he bought a stock 1944 two-door sedan. He chopped the top, shaved the door handles, wrenched the lights. It had chrome reverse wheels with baby moon hubcaps. He painted it midnight blue. It was the coolest car cruising North Long Beach back then. He knew George Barris when he and his brother had a body shop in Compton. Now, George designs cars for TV shows like Batman and the Monsters. And my dad has a body shop on Artesia. I've been held on there since I was a kid. My grandmother is a cashier at Dooley's Hardware. Her <coughs> 56 Chevy was stolen from its parking lot and abandoned in an alley. Whoa. It was pretty much stripped. Her insurance company totaled the car and valued what was left at $100. Grandma called me and said if I wanted the car, 
She would have it towed to my house and I could pay the hundred bucks. Well, the exterior wasn't bad, but the bumpers were gone. They'd ripped up the interior and taken out the radio, but the worst part was under the hood where a lot of the engine was missing. Dad and I worked on the body. I scoured the Wilmington junkyards for parts to rebuild the engine. It took a long time, but we got it running. I put in a month's four-track tape player, so we always got good music. There's a bunch of us who hang out brought together by our love of cars and cruising. Most of us have Chevys. I painted most of the guys' cars in my dad's shop. We all run our cars and lines. We hang out at Grissinger's drive-in on the corner of Atlantic and San Antonio. I'd say there are uh, 14 or 15 of us there pretty regularly. Weekends, we cruise around Long Beach amongst blasting out tunes. We always end up on Bellflower Boulevard. It's packed. There are guys like us with restored classic cars, and then there are high riders with a huge back tires and low riders with hydraulics going up and down. And nobody wants to go fast. It would be impossible anyway. Oh, man, it's a blast. Now, we're always on the hunt for the next car. Bob Dylan is playing on the months as me and my friend Chuck drive slowly down our teacher toward Norwalk Boulevard. Chuck is looking out the window trying to spot a car that we heard about. Then he says, oh, I think I saw it. Quick, turn around, go back, go back. There it is next to an old house, parked in a carport, half hidden by a tree. The front end of a 1944 coupe. The car I've always wanted. <laughs> so begins our new pattern. Anytime we're out, we cruise by to look at it. One night, it looks like someone is home. House of the Rising Sun plays as Chuck walks to the door. <coughs> it opens. He goes inside. He comes out ten minutes later and says, They might sell. The bumpers are, the bumpers are in the house, but there's no engine. A hundred bucks. The thought of owning the 40 coup is starting to keep me up at night. I haven't sunk a lot of money into the show. I could buy the 40 coupe, but it would sit until the Chevy would sit until I sell the Chevy. But then if I sell the Chevy, I don't have transportation until the 40 is drivable. Ah, I go over and over and over it again in my mind. Then one day we drive by the house. The Buffalo Springfield is singing Mr. Soul on the months. The Ford Coupe is gone. <laughs> Coming to California, speed shops. One reason that pushed so many people to migrate to California, and Southern California especially, was opportunity. New jobs, most based on the emerging technologies of the 1960s in such fields as aerospace, communications, medical innovations, and leisure activities, drew people from all parts of the United States. Skilled professionals, including doctors, nurses, teachers, machinists, and many others found work in the state's exploding industries, found homes in the new suburbs throughout the region, and eagerly sought out leisure time activities. Like so many people, so many young people in the 1960s, Joe Roos decided to try life in Southern California. After finishing his military service, he found work in the developing car culture, quickly gravitating to the Long Beach area and the Lions drag strip. There were many speed shops in the area, small businesses that sold everything enthusiasts needed to rebuild older cars or to build custom machines capable of competing at the dragster. Joe, along with thousands of others, found jobs delivering parts, stocking parts, helping out on race nights at Lions, and generally being part of something exciting. Lifetime friendships formed in this exciting environment, and the new career opportunities appeared to those looking to create a new California lifestyle for themselves. Joe, a talented photographer and writer, 
leveraged his skills and interest into a long and distinguished career as an automotive journalist, magazine editor, and author. His creative energy took him into the world of international auto racing and car development. He produced stories and photos for several generations of avid readers who enjoyed a car culture that literally knew no national boundaries. Another aspect of this developing California culture and lifestyle was the easy accessibility of higher education. The state's community college system and four-year university, universities expanded at warp speed in the 1950s and 1960s, creating space for returning military veterans, waves of baby boomers coming of age, and older adults seeking to reinvent themselves or learn new job skills to match the new technologies. The number of community colleges tripled in this era, offering classes in every skill and job category, from basic literacy to vocational courses to college transfer preparation. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Costs remained low until the 1990s as communities agreed to tax themselves to produce the workers needed for the state's growing population. Engineers, teachers, nurses, and skilled professionals such as welders, electricians, aviation mechanics, and automotive technicians flowed out of the new colleges and into the workplace. On a personal note, I remember well enrolling at Long Beach State in 1968 and being shocked, shocked, that I now had to pay fees of $88 per semester <laughs> for the privilege of continuing my college education. Shocked because my semester fees at Long Beach City College totaled $13. <laughs> Books and hamburgers, of course, were extra. Hi, my name is Kathy. I grew up across the street from Lucy and her parents. Lolly and Bill are great neighbors and good friends with my parents. Lucy was my babysitter. I'm 19 now, all grown up. It's 1972, almost 1973. I graduated from Jordan two years ago, and I go to Long Beach City College. Lucy was my favorite babysitter. She was so much fun. She teased my hair into a big bubble just like hers. She even paint my lips pink with her lipstick. Well, of course, she had to comb out my hair and wipe off the lipstick before my parents got home. She loved watching the Lions drag strip races on the television. She knew all about the cars and drivers. I loved watching her boyfriends come to pick her up. They drove customized Fords and Chevys. One had a car that bounced up and down, and the horn went, <laughs> She told me he was a low rider. Well, Lucy's married now, and she has two young children and a station wagon. A lot has happened since then. In 1968, two of my heroes, Robert F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King, were assassinated just two months apart. I hoped RFK would be our next president. The Vietnam War has really divided the country. My parents are Republicans. They voted for Nixon. They think America is doing the right thing fighting over there, but plenty of people disagree. There are protests on college campuses. In 1970, four students were killed at Kent State in Ohio for protesting the bombing in Cambodia. I go to marches and moratoriums to protest the war. And of course, my parents worry that something bad will happen, but well, they don't tell me that I can't go. Guys I know at City College worry about getting drafted. They have student deferments, of course, but those only last until they graduate. In June, I'll be finished at City College and will transfer to Long Beach State. Last year, I bought a used VW, a Volkswagen. It's clean and in good shape. It's beige, no stripes or flames. Seems like most everybody I know has a VW. They're easy to fix and don't use much gas, so they're inexpensive to run. And they're contributing less to the smog that is so bad that some days it makes my eyes water. Two years ago was the first Earth Day. I hope my generation will be the one that finally treats the environment with respect. 
having a small car makes me feel like I'm at least doing what I can to help. Right after I bought my VW, my parents had an eight-track tape player put into it. Uh, I love listening to my favorite songs when I'm driving. The music reflects how people my age feel about things, like uh, politics and the war. It seems like a million years ago that I sat on the couch with Lucy, my teased hair and my pink lips, watching the cars roar down the lion's track. Today, I saw in the paper that Lions Drag Strip is closing. The last race will be on December 2nd. For years, people complained about the noise. And the city says it needs the property to expand operations in the harbor. Well, things change, as the saying goes. Lucy's whole family is going to the final race. Her father helped get it started. And she can show her children a place that meant a lot to her when she was young. I imagine it's a bittersweet goodbye for everyone who will remember it fondly and tell their stories of the glory days of Lion's Drake's. <laughs> The 1970s. <clears throat> The golden promise of the previous three decades, when it seemed America could aspire to greatness and achieve dramatic advances, dimmed a bit in the early 1970s. Aside from the political murders of the 1960s, the country seemed at a standstill, with persistent problems of generational poverty, economic stagnation, and a sense that the country's progress had ground to a halt. Two big issues that illustrated this attitude, this sense of national malaise, were the war in Southeast Asia, focused after 1968 on Vietnam, and a recognition for the first time since really the 19th century that US, the United States faced major economic obstacles that we could not control. International events began to shape how Americans lived their lives, specifically energy. In the early 1970s, the US went from a net exporter of energy, primarily petroleum products, to a net importer of oil and gas. This produced a mighty shock at the nation's gas stations as fuel source, as fuel prices soared from a post-World War II low of about 39 cents a gallon in the middle 1960s, to, 90, to 69 cents a gallon in 1971, to 89 cents a gallon in 1973. Oh, nostalgic, isn't it? <laughs> Gas eventually passed the dollar gallon mark in 1974. The rest, as they say, is history. From the perspective of 2019, $1.59 a gallon in 1975 may seem like a miracle, yet everything is, of course, relative. When the minimum wage was $1.85 an hour, and a three-bedroom home in College Park Estates cost $34,000, and first-year teachers in the Long Beach Unified School District were paid $13,000 a year, gas at $1.59 doesn't seem so miraculous. Racers who had once who had once had what seemed like unlimited sources of cheap fuel, now face the reality that fuel would eat up a larger portion of their racing budgets. The conflict in Asia begun with little fanfare in 1949 as nations demanded freedom from European empires, drew the Americans in a decade later, fearful of increased Soviet influence in the region. While Laos, Burma, and later Cambodia all experienced the consequences of political and military conflict, U.S. concern focused mostly on Vietnam after 1968. The former French colony split in two halves in 1954, and the U.S. began to support the Southern Republic of Vietnam with a few dozen military advisors in 1959. That grew to 160,000 combat troops by 1966. Successive presidents committed American forces to the region, casting this as a geopolitical test of wills with the Soviet Union and China. What began, as, what began as a civil war, what had begun as a civil war in Vietnam, turned into an international conflict that put the world on the edge of nuclear showdown. As casualties mounted, the war became increasingly unpopular, prompting protest marches and newspaper editorials, urging a withdrawal of U.S. forces. Every evening, Americans got a close look at the intense fighting, really for the first time ever, as television crews sent home graphic reports about the battles that really produced clear-cut victories. It seemed as if America was fighting a war that had no end. 
1973, President Nixon began secret talks with all parties involved, and the U.S. began to withdraw, and American forces were fully out of the country by 1975. Yet the war cast a pall over the, over the country until it wound down. Even those who supported the political and international aspects of the conflict, conflict felt that it was the wrong fight in the wrong place at the wrong time. Aside from deaths on all sides, the physical destruction of the country of Vietnam and the wounds endured, endured by those serving in the military services, the greatest impact may, have, may lie in the deep divisions created in American society by the war, some of which remain to the present day. Tragically, the rate of suicide among Americans who served in that war has now surpassed the 58,000 military personnel who died in the war. I love this exhibit. You remember me, don't you? I'm Lucy. I was 15 the year Lions opened, and now, here I am, a grandmother closing in on 80. <sighs> Time flies, doesn't it? <laughs> After opening day, they had a rough time keeping attendance up. But when Mickey Thompson started scheduling races on Saturday night, the crowd showed up. Mickey was good at getting publicity. He staged a race between a quarter horse and a dragster. <laughs> a horse could be other quarter horses, but as it turned out, it couldn't be a dragster. <laughs> he convinced CBS to film an episode of The Monsters at Lions in 1965. In the show, Grandpa saved the day by building a Dragula car to win back Herman's coach. Even NBC got in the act when an episode of Adam 12 was shot at Lions. The plot included LAPD officers trying to move street racing hot rodders to a safe place like Lions. <coughs> oh, biggest names in hot rodding came to race. Many local mechanics and drivers like Tom the Mongoose McEwen and Don the Snake Prudhoe set speed records there. And their most famous match races were at Lions. They put aside their rivalry and formed a business called Wildlife Racing. When Mattel began to include hot rods in their Hot Wheels line, the company partnered with McEwen and Prudhomme to help promote them. The McEwen Prudhomme matchups enhanced Lion's reputation. Dragsters from all over came here to challenge them. One of them was Big Daddy Don Garlands, who came from Florida with his cars, the Swamp Rats. <laughs> he even lost part of his foot at Lions when the transmission exploded and the car broke in half. He was out for the rest of the season. During that time, he built the first dragster with the engine behind the driver rather than in front. Eventually, the design became the standard for top fuel dragsters. Alliance never took a profit. Every dollar above expenses was donated to organizations like Boys and Girls Clubs, the Wise, and various nonprofits serving the blind. In its final year, it cleared $70,000, which was added to the 300,000 it had donated since its opening in 1955. That would be well over $1 million today. Oh, it was great being a teenager in the 1950s. We had prosperity, optimism, we even had Elvis. <laughs> Those jackets hanging over there. Take me back to my high school days. Every school had a car club, maybe two or three. At Jordan, we had the cutouts and the sultans. The boys who wore those jackets probably went to Lions to watch the races and maybe run their cars. Many were drafted or volunteered to fight in Vietnam. 
I certainly hope most of them who served lived to return. But in the end, lions couldn't survive the noise complaints and the growth in the harbor. And the 1970s oil crisis dampened the enthusiasm for cruising and expedited the popularity of fuel-efficient cars. But car shows still draw crowds. There are museums like the Peterson in Los Angeles and the NHRA Museum in Pomona. On Thursday nights, Irwindale Speedway becomes Irwindale Drag Strip, and anyone can race for 20 bucks. In 1965, the Early Times Car Club was founded by guys who owned and loved classic hot rods. Beginning in 1993, they partnered with Mattel to produce Hot Wheels to celebrate their mid-winter rod run. You know what? You can own a 2003 commemorative car. <laughs> the Historical Society is selling them for $5 in different colors. coming today, for listening to our stories, and for supporting the Historical Society of Long Beach. Good night.